Hey everybody, it's Doug here, and uh, this is our second episode of Garage Talk with Doug. I think I've got some of the technical issues that we had uh, last week resolved a bit. Uh, I'll be here taking your calls and uh, answering your questions. Before I start out though, I just want to put out this disclaimer. All information that I provide on this channel is strictly for informational purposes only. The proper way to diagnose an automobile, or any vehicle for that matter, is to take it to your mechanic and have your mechanic look it over, perform diagnostics, and road test the vehicle. Again, that is the only proper way of diagnosing an automobile. John, how are you, John? It's good to see you aboard. I'm glad you were able to make it. I'm looking forward to uh, picking up any other people. John, in the meantime, if you have any questions for me, please feel free to ask. All right, John. I hope you're well. Uh, I just want to go, since I don't have very many people on board right now, I just want to talk a little bit about a question that gets asked of me very often, and that is, Doug, how often should I check the tire inflation in my vehicle's tires? You know, we're talking about tire pressure. First off, I want to recommend that you check tire pressure at least once a month. In fact, the more often you check it, the better off. But at least once a month, folks. Uh, I try to check mine at least every week to two weeks. I find that, uh, you know, due to ambient temperatures outside, the pressure inside the tires tends to change. And therefore, for best handling characteristics and best tire wear, and also for fuel mileage, the best thing to do is to adjust the pressure as necessary. Tire pressure should always be checked when the tires are cold. And despite popular belief, most people will say inflate the tires to what the placard says on the inside of your left door jam. And those are the manufacturer's suggested tire pressures. What I'm going to tell you is a little different. If you want to get the maximum amount of mileage out of your tires, and you also want to get the best tire wear and handling and performance from your tires, I recommend inflating those tires to about three pounds under what the maximum inflation is during the summer times. During the winter times, take it all the way and up to what the maximum pressure is printed on the outside of your sidewall of your tires. Generally, that'll be 35 pounds, 44 pounds, etc., depending on the tire manufacturer and the type of tire it is, and the speed rating of the tire. All right, keep that in mind, folks. Tire pressure is very important. Uh, it improves your gas mileage. It improves the handling of the vehicle. It improves the tire patch that the tire lays down on the surface of the road, and that, in turn, is what improves the handling. All right, I see we've got uh, about seven people on board right now. I welcome you all. Once again, this is Garage Talk with Doug. And once again, I just want to put out the dis disclaimer that all information I provide, I provide for you knowing that I cannot make a full diagnosis without looking at your vehicle. The only proper way of making a diagnosis on a vehicle is to take it into your mechanic, have them perform diagnostics and road tests, and then they can present you with a good idea as to what repairs or what services your vehicle is going to need. Uh, give me just a second here, folks. I just want to go back in the chat and see what's come up here. So give me just a moment here. Are you at Kelly Binkley, how are you, Kelly? John, John, yes. You have a question. You have a 92 Merc Cruiser with a 5-liter Ford engine. Yes, that's a 302. Running across Lake... Number four piston destinated and blew a hole in the piston. What could cause this? Asked John. All right. John, there's a couple of things that can cause this. Is this an older Merc Cruiser? If it is, you might have had a carbon deposit build up on a valve, increasing the compression in that cylinder. And uh, that cylinder might not have been with, able to withstand the pressure. And uh, that caused it to blow a hole through the piston. Uh, another thing that could happen is a valve could possibly hang up in the open position. When the piston rose up, either during the compression stroke or the power, or I should say the uh, exhaust stroke, uh, the piston may have smacked into the valve, 
causing it to knock a hole in a piston it would probably also bend the valve all right there's a couple of ideas as to what could have happened the other thing that could have happened is that uh, you might have just over revved the engine to the point where that particular cylinder was weak and uh, that caused it to blow hope that helped help to clear things up a little bit for you John uh, keep those questions coming folks let me see what else I have up here let me uh, tacking to catch a fresh breeze how are you thank you very much I appreciate that uh, well Keisha yeah you run 35 and everything uh, that's fine as long as 35 is what the maximum inflation is that's printed on the outside sidewall of your tire all right if it calls for 44 I recommend running 44 during the winter months I'd run it about 40 during the summer months allow for that extra four PSI for uh, you know increased pressure in the tire as the tire gets hot because as the tire gets hot we all know that ambient air heats up the pressure rises when that air is contained in a vessel being that a tire is a vessel the air temperature is going to rise and therefore increase the tire pressure all right keep that in mind guys let me get back here to the chat pardon my fingers in the way okay we're fielding more questions here, folks, so please keep them coming. Kelly, how are you? You have any questions for me, Kelly? Brett Stevens, welcome. Any questions, please feel free to speak up. That's what my channel is all about. I put up this information for free, and it will always be for free. However, I do ask that if you can assist me financially in any way with donations, you can donate to me through PayPal or my GoFundMe. I'll put up those links shortly. And... Uh, wish you all good John says the valves are good John my guess is that you probably had a carbon deposit was it an older engine John can you answer me that Dober do thank you very much smoking I appreciate that please yeah thumbs up are free folks if you like my channel please subscribe please hit that thumbs up button Tagging to catch a fresh breeze says, I'm boat shopping and would appreciate your thoughts on how to assess old diesel engines. I am familiar with 70s vintage Yamahas and will prefer one of those. All right, let me see whether I can field this for you. I mean, my field of expertise is more automotive gasoline engines. However, I was trained in diesel engines. I would say look for a diesel engine, try and get as much documentation as far as service on that diesel engine goes, especially if it's an older engine. You want to make sure that it was serviced properly. You want to make sure that proper maintenance was carried out on that engine. I would also start by looking at the condition of the engine oil, the antifreeze, checking all of that, checking the hoses, looking over the engine in general to see if the person maintained the rest of it. Chances are, if they maintain the rest of it, they maintain the engine itself. I hope that helps. If you uh, want me to elaborate further, please feel free to let me know. Kelly. Kelly says, I believe air pressure in tires increases or decreases a pound for every 10 degrees of ambient temperature change. Uh, I'm not exactly sure as to the exact change in pressure, given the degrees of temperature change. But yes, it does change. And as long as you go and inflate your tires to no more than maximum inflation is printed on the outside of the tire sidewall, you won't get into any trouble. In fact, you increase the tire patch, which improves handling, improves the suspension system on the car, and just overall gets the car to handle better. It also improves your tire life and makes your tires last longer. Hope that helps you. Yeah, it is a 1992, and John says it was rebuilt a year ago. John sounds to me like uh, something wasn't set up right. Maybe valve clearance wasn't right. Uh, I don't know exactly without tearing into it, removing the cylinder head, and, and looking up inside the engine. Uh, the only other way I know of getting in there is with a bore scope. If you have one handy, you can always pull out the spark plug, take a look in there, and, uh, and see. But... Uh, Something certainly wasn't put together correctly. All right, let's see. Billy Boy says, I can't share your link, Doug. Uh, yeah, Billy Boy, uh, that's because I haven't made you mod, and in order to 
share a link, you have to be a moderator. All right, uh, that'll be coming, Billy. I, I appreciate all the assistance you can give me on Carl's channel. That's Sailing with Grandpa. I just want to put a plug out there for Carl. Uh, without Carl, I wouldn't have gotten started in this. And uh, he kind of gave me the incentive to get my channel up and going. So, uh, Carl, thank you very much for that. Uh, just kudos to you, buddy. All right, let's see what else we have here. Mangoes are great. Snapple mango teaches just like that. <laughs> what do you mean it's not working out? Don't mow the lawn. That's funny, Pilot. Oh, Keisha says the pilot says it doesn't need it. Okay, Pilot, you tell him. Uh, tagging the catch a breeze. Yes, it does help. What do you think of oil analysis? Is it worth the added expense? You know, in certain cases, yes, it is worth the added expense. Uh, an oil analysis will tell you exactly what contaminants are in the oil, uh, which gives you good insight as to what kind of wear the engine has had on it. However, you can do kind of your own oil analysis. Uh, you can't do chemical breakdowns unless, of course, you're a chemist. But you can look at the oil. You can see if there's water in the oil. All right, if there's water in the oil, it will kind of look like a milky brown, almost like a coffee color. Uh, in pulling the radiator cap off, if there's a head cylinder leak or anything like that, you can look at the radiator cap. There may be uh, a latte-colored foam up around the uh, radiator cap seals. Uh, it sometimes accumulates when water is getting into the oil. Uh, you can smell the oil and see if there's uh, odor of gasoline in the oil. If there is, then the engine's been running too rich and uh, oil is getting down into the crankcase and contaminating the oil. So those are all ways that you can uh, do an oil analysis without actually sending it out to a chemist. Uh, you can also look at the oil, feel it with your fingers, see if it feels gritty. If it's gritty, chances are there's metallic shavings in the oil, and that means that you have severe internal engine wear going on. So those are all things to keep in mind. Again, I hope that helps answer your question regarding oil analysis. All right. Of course, the best way to do it is to send it out to a chemical lab, have them do an analysis. They give you a chemical breakdown as to exactly what contaminants are in the oil and what's going on there. All right, let's see what else we have here. Billy Boy, always trying to help you, Doug. You're a good guy. Thank you. Oh, stop. Don't call Pilot an ass. Pilot's a good guy, too. In fact, I appreciate all of you guys getting on my channel from... Carl's channel and coming over and checking me out and helping me get a good start. In fact, I got a tremendous response from last week. Uh, I ended up with uh, about 79 subscribers. I've had over 380 views to date. And uh, now that we've got the technical issues worked out, such as I stopped backlighting myself and I've got the uh, auto rotate on on my phone, uh, then, you know, hopefully things will get better as we go along. I plan on doing videos and posting them, showing you certain maintenance procedures and vehicle repair procedures on vehicles as we go here. It's just that we're just getting started, and, uh, you know, it takes a little time to put this stuff together. Uh, first off, I need to get a good tripod. I just ordered a little one, and uh, hope to have that here before next Saturday's broadcast. In fact, uh, folks, I'm taking input from you. If you think that you'd like to see me on more than just once a week, let me know. And uh, we'll see what we can do as far as arranging the schedule to where I can do this. The reason I go on on Saturdays is because it's kind of crazy for me during the week. I do dialysis. The only days that I'm free is Tuesdays and Thursdays. And, uh, you know, it's a little difficult for me sometimes to get on. But, uh, you know, if you feel that you'd like me to be on more than once a week, I certainly will try to accommodate you. All right, let me get back to the chat here. Uh... Tagging to catch a fresh breeze says, yeah, I've seen that sludge on a radiator cap before. I won't tell you what that cost me. Yeah, it probably ended up costing you having to remove the cylinder heads and doing a cylinder head job. Uh, replacing the, uh, you know, the head gaskets and uh, remachining the cylinder heads, making sure that they were cut down and are square when they go back on. So, uh, yeah, I can believe how much it cost you. Uh, remember, I was a master mechanic. I was in the trade for 34 years. I taught in the schools also during that time, and uh, I've seen a hell of a lot. Uh, in fact, you wouldn't believe some of the crazy things I've seen. In fact, uh, later on, if I don't get a lot of questions, I'll talk to you about one of the craziest things I ever encountered. 
Uh, it had to do with uh, an engine hydraulically locking itself up. And uh, like I said, if I don't get uh, a bunch of questions here that I'd like to answer first, we'll talk about that a bit. Okay, Billy Billy says, good info, Doug. I've always tested the oil and coolant on my generators for years. Yeah, Billy, that's the first thing that I'd look at in looking over any vehicles. Check the condition of the oil. Check the condition of the uh, antifreeze or coolant. Uh, I'd also, you know, stuff a rag down the tank and withdraw it and smell the fuel. See if it smells stale. If I smell stale, of course, I'd uh, get that changed out. What does your check... Uh, I'm sorry... Brett Stevens asks, what's your take on fuel and oil additives? Some people call it snake oil. There are some good fuel additives and oil additives out there, and there are some bad ones, Brett. Uh, what can I say? One of the fuel additives that I like to use, and that we used extensively in the trade, is called Tecron, and it's made by Chevron. Uh, it's an oil, I should say, it's a fuel additive that goes right in your tank. It helps to clean the fuel system, the injectors, the valves, the intake. I mean, it, it's used widely and considered a good additive by uh, by us folks in the trade and I uh, I'll give you my endorsement on that one okay at Chevron Tecron as far as oil additives go not necessary in this day and age with the advent of synthetic oils synthetic oils you've got long life oils now that the advertisers claim will last 12 to 15 thousand miles in your car in fact BMW and Mercedes Benz tends to recommend nothing but these long life oils you know, synthetic long-life oils for their automobiles these days. I have a 10-year-old BMW X3, and they recommend that I use a full synthetic long-life oil. Uh, they suggest Castrol. However, I've been using Mobile. Uh, as I haven't been able to get Castrol, I'll use Mobile One, uh, which is a full synthetic. Uh, when I'm able to get it, I'll use the Castrol long-life. But uh, I always use what the manufacturer recommends regarding... SAE rating, which is extremely important that you use the correct SAE rating of oil. SAE stands for the Society of Automotive Engineers, and they're the ones that come up with the designations for motor oil as to what motor oils to use in which engines. The other important rating is the viscosity rating, which is basically how easily the oil flows at warm and cold temperatures. All right, if they recommend an SAE 5W30 oil, it simply means the oil will have the consistency of a 5-weight oil at cold temperatures and the consistency of a 30-weight oil when the oil is fully warmed up. The W simply means that the oil is suitable for winter use. Alright, hope that answers that question. Yes, Brett, that was a great question. Billy Soy Boyce is a great question. Yes, taking to... I'm sorry, tacking to catch a fresh breeze. Getting back to that, uh, you know, cylinder head job, yeah, he says that's exactly what had to be done. Yeah, I figured as much. John Dolan, I see you've been snacking. You've left your box of snacks behind you. Uh, no, John, those are actually dog snacks, all right? Those are my old Roy's for my dogs. In fact, there's two boxes of dog snacks there. They're not mine. They're for the dog. Uh, I gave up eating dog snacks a little while back. <laughs> it was hell on the stomach, John. All right, let's get back to the chat here. All right, Steve Ford has a question. He says, uh, trouble is it's a long one, and YouTube only allows 200 characters to be posted in one go, so I have three parts in which I will have to... Let's see, in which I will have to... I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Go ahead. Let's get to this. All right, Holshutz is getting my oil changed today. I need a new air filter. Do you recommend OEM, or am I fine with aftermarket like a K&N? Uh, I assume you mean K&N. K&N is a great filter. You will get better flow through that filter. Of course, the more air we can get into an engine, the more horsepower that engine can make, and the happier that engine is. Uh, however, an aftermarket filter is just fine. Uh, I just changed my air filter out on my Grand Marquis about two weeks ago. Uh, I put it in an STP uh, high flow filter. It's a disposable, it works well, it's a paper filter, but uh, it's well bound, it doesn't come apart. Uh, it's advisable to change your filter, folks, about 
every 20,000 miles, more often if you're operating in dusty or city conditions where there's more pollutants in the air. Also, if you have air conditioning, your car has what they call a cabin filter. Make sure you change that too. Dust tends to collect up in there, and if you notice that you're sneezing when you put on your air conditioner, it probably means that that filter is dirty. You might even have mold up in there. You want to get that out. So to keep yourself healthy, make sure that you change your cabin filter as well. John Dolan says, I blew a 375 horsepower 396 using STP. Yeah, I don't particularly care for STP oil additives, John. Uh, you know, they came on the scene. I just don't care for them. Billy Boy says, I've been Luke using Lucas for our for years on our plants and generators. Uh, yeah, Lucas, I think, is one of the better oil additives. Uh, yeah, I fill the filter up with first, yes. When you do an oil change, if you can at all fill the filter before you put the filter up on your vehicle's engine, do so, because it takes about 30 seconds, roughly, for the oil pump to prime that filter and during which time you're not getting any oil to the moving parts in your engine which causes engine wear all right in fact most wear occurs on the engine when you first start it because it takes the oil pump a little while to get that oil flowing to the parts that need lubrication yeah well Keisha I would run only mobile one in my wife's Hemi if I had a Hemi too uh, the wife has the BMW and I run nothing but synthetic mobile one for the most part in hers, unless of course I'm able to get the Castrol, which is what BMW recommends. Steve Ford says, Doug, love your channel. This is from England, but probably applies to all cars. Hopefully I have a Hyundai Coupe, 2 liter. Alright, I'm sorry, a uh, version is called a Tiburon. Yes, familiar with those models, we have them here as well. What's your question, Steve? It has a sports chassis which gives a hard ride. You feel every bump in the road. It holds the road in corners like it's on rails. Yeah, the Tiburon was their sports model for Hyundai. Uh, sports models tend to have a stiffer ride. They hold the road better that way. And, uh, you know, as a result, they tend to have a stiffer suspension. Uh, Steve says, I've had the springs and shocks checked. They're all okay. Yeah, I tend to believe that, Steve question is, is you know of any way to soften up the ride comfort by any means? Yes, yeah, Steve, you could throw some softer shocks on that are uh, just regular road shocks instead of sports suspension shocks. However, you're going to give up some of that handling characteristic. When you uh, put a softer suspension on it, you're going to find that the car is going to give up some of that holding the rails, quote, handling characteristic. So keep that in mind, Steve. But that is what you can do if you'd like to soften the ride. All right. All right, more questions, folks. Keep those questions coming. I love it. All right. There's no such thing as a stupid question. The only stupid question is the one that you don't ask. All righty. Steve Ford says thanks. You're very welcome, Steve. All right. Kelly, you still with us? I uh, saw that you were on board, but I... Uh, haven't seen you answering any questions, asking any questions, I should say. Feel free to chime in. I always appreciate our lady viewers. Uh, they tend to ask some of the best questions, believe it or not. You know, especially regarding uh, vehicle maintenance and uh, and just overall, you know, how to check things on their, on their cars. So uh, keep those questions coming in. Folks, I see we have 13 people watching right now. Eight thumbs up. Please hit the thumbs up if you like my channel. All right, keep them coming. All right, tacking to catch a fresh breeze. Says, Doug, please find a way to get your PayPal posted. Uh, yes, I will post that, uh, even in the comments after the live stream ends. I don't have a lot of money, but we'll send a small stipend to you. Listen, anything that you send is greatly appreciated, even if it's just a dollar. Uh, you know, I'm not doing this for the money. I'm doing it to try and help you out. However, money is appreciated. I am tight because I am on disability. And uh, I have had a tremendous number of surgeries in the last two years and have some very, very uh, extensive medical bills that need to be paid. Uh, however, I do have payment plans worked out with my doctors and hospitals, and uh, they're being very patient with me. So uh, I will get that PayPal posted. Uh, in the meantime, if you go to PayPal 
and just search my name, you will find my PayPal, and uh, you can donate that way in the meantime. Uh, my problem is, is I believe I need my uh, laptop in order to post that information. My laptop currently is uh, down and out. It's not working. Uh, I need to get that rectified or borrow somebody's laptop so that I can go on and post that information to my channel. Yeah, Billy Boy, I will get that up soon. Uh, yeah, Billy, you know what? I'm not sure how to make you a moderator, but as soon as I find out... In fact, let me see what I can do here, Billy. Let's see if I highlight your name or... I know there's got to be some way of making you a mod. All right, so I will figure that out, Billy, and uh, talk to Carl about it. And uh, next time you're on, Wakisha, you too. Uh, you know, I don't have any mods right now. I'm doing it all myself. And uh, I appreciate you guys, uh, you know, stepping up to the challenge if you so are inclined to do so. Wakisha Pilot says, Steve, I changed the shocks on my Corvette to just stock from high-performance suspension. Doug is right. It made a world of difference. Yeah, that will soften up the ride. Uh, you know, a lot of guys with sports cars, you know, as we get older, we uh, don't like to get jostled around so much. It's not good on the kidneys or uh, other organs, for that matter. And, uh, you know, we appreciate a softer ride. And by changing up from a sports suspension to putting on just a regular road shock, it does make a big difference. You can do the same thing with struts, too, which is what you have on your Hyundai, Steve. All right, hope that helped. All right, what else can I say, guys? Hope, uh, you know, the technical issues are getting better. Uh, I know that we had some issues the first time out. That was me, and entirely me, and I take full responsibility for that. Uh, my daughter actually helped me to resolve the issue, you know, with the phone not being rotated right. Simply was that I didn't have auto-rotate on. You know, I'm, I'm old school, and uh, I'm not as uh, adept as I should be when it comes to this stuff. But, uh, you know, I do my best, and uh, eventually we get it fixed. Wood Beast, how are you? Oh, Wood Beast is asking, what year is the vet? Yeah, the wife's GTI beats the crap out of us. It's like riding a go-kart. Uh, yeah, the GTI, once again, sports suspension. All right, if you uh, want to change out your shocks, I don't know. Billy Boy, let me ask you, how many miles you have on your wife's GTI? All right, get back to me with that information. Uh, if it's more than 50,000 miles, uh, again, I recommend changing out the shocks at about that time. Fifty to 60,000 miles is about right. Uh, by putting a road shock on, you will soften the ride, improve... Uh, you know, the, the softness of the suspension, but you will give up some of the riding characteristics. Billy Billy, with 42,000, you're getting close, so keep that in mind. Again, when you get to about 50,000 miles, I'd, uh, I'd swap them out then. Hope that helps, Billy. You know, speaking of shocks, let's talk about how to test your shocks and struts to see if they're working properly. All right, the proper way to test a sh strut or a shock is to do what we call a bounce test. It simply is a matter of pushing down on each corner of the car, getting it to bounce, and then seeing how many times it rebounds before it stops. Generally, a vehicle shouldn't bounce more than one and a half times after you let go. If it bounces more than one and a half times, it indicates the shocks are worn and the shocks need to be replaced. All right, so keep that in mind, folks. Yeah, Billy Boy says the car is awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I'm kind of partial to the GTIs myself. Uh, I've always been more of a Ford Mopar man, but, uh, you know, I appreciate all automobiles, from uh, Audis to Yugos. Yeah, even Yugos. All right, well, Keisha, you said you were going to have a two-cycle question for me. He says, my Toro snowblower is set for years, five at least. What should I expect to get it started again? Well, fortunately, two-cycle engines tend to want to start right up. I would simply change out the fuel in it, make sure that you do the proper mix of two-cycle oil to your fuel, pull the spark plug out, clean it up, 
Uh, if you have a can of compressed air, I might give a squirt of compressed air into the cylinder after you take the spark plug out just to make sure any sediment that's in there it gets blown out. And uh, I would say it should pretty much start up. You might need to re-hole overhaul the carburetor because sometimes there's varnish that collects in the carburetor you also may need to clean out the fuel tank but uh, that would be about the extent of getting that engine up and running again okay let me get back to the chat all right well Keisha I hope that helped you all right, Brett Stevens says, just did rear struts on my Honda CRV at 170,000 miles only. One was blown out. You definitely don't live in New York, Brett, because uh, up here, man, we uh, blow out struts and shocks left and right. Our roads are horrible. There's potholes and patches all over the place, and it really wreaks hell with our suspension systems. So uh, for you to get 170,000 miles out of them, that's fantastic. Way to go. And... Uh, Keep it going, buddy. I mean, uh, 170,000 miles. You know, it's uh, it's about midlife on a on a Honda CRV. So uh, just keep taking care of it. Keep, keep taking care of it. Keep the maintenance up. Keep that baby going. All right. <coughs> Billy Boy says my 2500 HD with an 8 inch to 6 inch lift on it. 38s rides like a caddy. You have air suspension on that with that 8 to 6 inch lift. If you do, that's why it rides like a caddy. Of course, it's a heavy vehicle. And we all know that the more weight you be able to put down on the road, the better it's going to ride. So, uh, yeah, it sounds like whoever set up your suspension, Billy Boy, did, a right, did the right thing with it. Uh, for you to get a good ride out of an 8 to 6 inch lift is, uh, is artistry, really. Uh, you know, you have to know what you're doing. It can be done, but uh, you better know what you're doing suspension-wise. All right, John says, I had a 66 Corvette. My wife wanted to drive it to work one day. I told her to check the water. Okay, John, keep that coming. <coughs> what Beast says to Wakisha, he just sold his 2008 vet. <coughs> Pardon me, folks. That, uh, <coughs> that car was a blast. It was scary fast. Excuse me while I take a sip of water, guys. I hope the audio quality is much better this week. I know last week we had a bit of a problem with audio. It was cutting in and out. Hopefully this week is much better. If I do cut out, please let me know. Uh, hopefully we don't buffer away here. We shouldn't. I should have very good connectivity here in the house. John gets back and says, I asked her later if it needed water. She said she put in four quarts, but it didn't change the level. So I asked her where she put the water, and she showed me the oil filler. Oh, no, John. Oh, no. I hope you got to it before she ran that engine, John, because that could be a mighty expensive mistake. Yeah, John, listen, I've come across it all. Uh, in fact, you know, let me just go through the chat here and then I'll talk about that engine hydraulically locking up uh, because that was a rule, probably the oddest thing I've ever seen Billy Boy CST lift Deaver leaves in the back and of course added airbags so I could actually tow something yeah Billy Boy that's why you're having such a good ride I figured you had something like that set up uh, that air suspension makes all the difference in the world when you're doing those kind of lifts on, uh, you know, on a big pickup 4x4 like that. Well, Keisha says, thanks, I have a third generation Cadillac CTS. It doesn't ride like a truck, Billy. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, I imagine not. <coughs> Brett asks, what do I think about Tesla Electric? I think it is absolutely awesome. This new Roadster that Elon Musk has put out, 0 to 60 in 1.9 seconds. It's incredible. It is absolutely incredible. I mean, you're not getting that out of Ferrari and Lamborghini yet. They're still in the 3 second to 2.9 second area. All right, so I think what Elon Musk is doing is absolutely awesome. All right. 
taking take tacking to catch your first breeze says I got a scoot. I'll check back later for your PayPal. You're doing good work here. Keep it up. Thank you for tuning in. Appreciate that and uh, look forward to having you back on the channel in the future. <coughs> Thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. I'm glad to hear the audio and video is good. <coughs> yeah, Billy Boy, that car is insane. I'm talking about the Tesla Roadster. It is absolutely insane. You hit the accelerator on that, and that electric motor will snap you back in your seat and pin you there. Uh, you know, you talk about doing the $100 dash challenge, where you lay a $100 bill up on a dash, and you try and grab it off when somebody is in full acceleration mode. You would not be able to lift your arm to snatch that $100 bill off the dash. Yeah, John says she ran it all day that night. I changed, okay, all day, and that night I changed the oil and filters. Good thing water is a good lubricant. Just need to catch it before rust sets in. Uh, not when it's inside the crankcase of an engine, John. It's not a good lubricant then. However, probably because you got to it so soon, you saved the motor. All right, because uh, all that does is it prevents, you know, oil from getting into the areas that it needs and it dilutes it. <coughs> 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 also, it helps speed air into the oil and aerate the oil and air we know is not a good lubricant. Okay. All right, listen, I'm caught up on the chat, so I'm going to talk a little bit. You know, guys, bear with me because I don't have my tripod. I'm holding this camera phone in my hands. So if I'm moving around a bit much, uh, I'm sorry about that. I will have a tripod next week, so at least that's what Walmart tells me. They're shipping it directly here to the house. should be here on Wednesday. Uh, in any case, talking about this hydraulic lockup of an engine, uh, this happened to me on a vehicle that came into my auto shop when I worked at John F. Kennedy High School up in the Riverhead area of the Bronx. Uh, it happened to belong to one of the people that lived in the neighborhood, uh, happened to be a student's uh, parent, and uh, he came in with the car. And I'm looking it over and looking it over because the car would not crank and the engine would not turn over by hand. And uh, I started by pulling the spark plugs and uh, funny thing, when I pulled the spark plugs they looked like they were wet with something that looked like water. So I says, okay, let's try and figure out how water is getting into the combustion chamber. It's got to be coming in or through either the head gaskets or being sucked in through the intake manifold. Well, I ended up doing a check of the vacuum hoses and found that he had accidentally taken his windshield washer hose and attached it to a vacuum port on the intake manifold. So it was sucking windshield washer fluid through the intake manifold and into the combustion chamber. Well, we all know that liquids cannot be compressed, so therefore the engine as the pistons were trying to move upwards in the cylinders, couldn't because of the fluid that was taking up the volume in the cylinder. And as we said, fluids can't be compressed. <clears throat> now, if the engine had run, I might have noticed this fluid coming out the exhaust pipe because as the exhaust valve was opened, it would have pushed the fluid out. But it was actually sucking in so much that it was hydraulically locking up the engine. So that was kind of a crazy thing. What did we do to fix it? Well, we pulled all the spark plugs out. Once we did that, we were able to crank the engine over, pushing the fluid out of the cylinders. We hooked this windshield wiper fluid hose up correctly, hooked the vacuum hoses up correctly, and sure enough, it fired right up and off he went. So how's that for a slightly crazy story here, folks? They can insure multiple vehicles with a low monthly payment. Brett Stevens, the only problem with them I see you have to have it fixed by their dealer and limited repairs by yourself. I heard dealers charge like 150 an hour. I may be wrong. Yeah, in my area they get between about 135 and 150 dollars an hour for labor. Uh, keep in mind that you know these guys have gone to school. They keep going to school. That is, if they're like me and uh, you know wanted to keep their skills up that's what you have to do because the technology is changing faster than even industry can keep up with it all right yeah 150 is on the cheap side yeah 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 lucky lee didn't bend a rod yeah he's very lucky he didn't bend a rod but uh you know what saved him 
was that engine hydraulic relocking itself up. Uh, again, the fluid kept the piston from rising in the cylinder. So, uh, you know, he fortunately, I, I guess, you know, didn't run the engine. And uh, by not running the engine, he didn't do any damage to it. <clears throat> well, Keisha Pilot, I had popcorn coming out of the exhaust one year after storage. It was funny. Yeah, it gets funny. You know what happens when you get uh, mice and you have a vehicle in storage? They like to crawl up in pipes like the exhaust pipes. And they'll crawl up right to the catalytic converter and it gets real hot in that catalytic converter. Well, those popcorn seeds, when a catalytic converter gets hot, will tend to pop. And it's funny because you will blow them right out the tailpipe. Uh, thanks for sharing. Just joined. Hey, Brad. Welcome aboard. Good to have you. We're here answering your automotive questions. Hey, I just want to pan down on my shirt here for a minute because I tend to like this shirt. It says, I'm a mechanic. I can't fix stupid, but I can't fix what stupid does. And that pretty much sums it up, folks. I've seen a lot of stupid things out there that people do. I've seen wrong fluids being put in master cylinders, wiping out the entire braking system on cars where I've had to repair by replacing the master cylinder, the proportioning valve, flushing all the lines, changing out all the rubber hoses, uh, you know, changing out wheel cylinders, rebuilding calipers. I mean, it's, you know, people do stupid things, and it's not just people, you know, doing their own maintenance. I've seen this happen at Jiffy Lubes and, and Quick Lubes and things like that. So, you know, keep in mind, folks, that just because you're taking it to a professional doesn't mean that they necessarily know what they're doing. Because even though it's a professional shop, the people in the bays may not be professional and may not have the training necessary to properly service your vehicle. Be careful who you take your vehicle to. If you have a good mechanic, make sure you take care of them and keep them. Let them know that it's doing a great job for you. Mechanic appreciates hearing those words so much. We got into this field, or I got into this field, because I love fixing machines, and uh, I love taking something that doesn't run and making it run again. All right, that's what I'm in it about. Uh, you know, we are going a bit longer today than usual. Uh, I appreciate all the questions coming in. My live streams will get longer as I get more and more people on and get those questions you know, in, uh, I try and answer all of your questions. Just keep in mind that uh, the answers I give are for informational purposes only. The only proper way to diagnose an automobile or any vehicle for that matter is to take it to your mechanic, let them run diagnostic tests and road test the vehicle. All right, uh, the information that I offer is strictly that, information only. All right, let's see and let's get back here to the chat. Yeah, Corvette pipes are low. Yeah, that's uh, whether they come out the back end or their side pipes. Yes, Wakisha, they're very low. Watch out for speed bumps and potholes and things like that. <clears throat> John Dolan, happens a lot when cars run, to, well, I should say when someone runs their car into a lake or river and the engine is running. Yes, because it will suck that water right in. Even if the engine isn't running, John, all right, uh, just, you know, Gravitational forces alone will force that oil, I should say, that water into the combustion chambers and cause the engine to hydraulically lock. Okay, Brad asks, Doug, what are your thoughts on these third-party scopes that diagnose a car system? Uh, some of them are very good. Uh, I think the best scope out there for the money is a Zurich scope. Uh, it's called the ZR13. Uh, <coughs> it's an OBD2 compatible unit. <coughs> it's compatible with all cars 1996 and newer. Uh, it may not be compatible with BMWs, Mercedes, Benz, Audis. You, you know, I don't know exactly what the compatibility is with those systems. But uh, it's an overall good scope for the money. It's uh, about $165 at Harbor Freight. And, uh, you know, in fact, I've been looking into it and thinking about purchasing one because my... $3,000 OBD2 Genesis scanner just uh, took a dump on me. Uh, I'm going to have to send that in and see whether it's just a battery or whether uh, it's something more that needs to be repaired because I'm not ready to give up on a $3,000 scan tool. You know, it was a lot of money and uh, in fact I uh, need new upgrades for that as well because I only go up to about uh, 
2007 with the uh, current software that I have because I've been out of the trade for so long. All right, let's see. John Dolan, nitro burning engines reach optimum horsepower just before the nitro turns to a solid. Yes, they do. All right, however, nitro doesn't turn to a solid when we inject it into the engine. And if it did, we'd have a big problem because we would be blowing pistons left and right. In fact, sometimes that happens when the nitro jets are set too large. You get too uh, coarse a mist. And uh, when you see them below the intake manifold in the blower off of a car that's nitro injected, uh, that's what has happened. Billy Boy, in this time of day, whether you were mechanical or not, search before you take your car to just anyone. Yes, Billy, do your research, check them out, see what kind of reviews they have. Uh, you know, there's a lot of shady guys out there that claim to be mechanics that uh, are really nothing more than glorified parts changers, and they will charge you dearly, you know, and it will cost you dearly because you'll end up having to have the work done two or three times over. Wakisha says he's got every option but the glass roof. He's got a 4 plus 3 Nash transmission. Very nice. What's so different in an engine on dragsters and funny cars is it mostly the fuel. Uh, yes, it is mostly the fuel. In fact, on a nitro engine and turbocharged engines, the compression ratio is about the same as on your everyday passenger car. About 8 to 1 compression. Uh, if we raise the compression up on those engines, we blow those engines left and right. However, for naturally aspirated race engines, they could be running as high as 13 to 1 compression. All right, generally, they like to run in the 11 to 12 to 1 compression area. All right, so uh, that's the difference. It is the fuel. Yeah, nitro turns solid under compression. Yes, it does, John. Uh, that's why you get that kind of burn in the uh, in the cylinder. However, like I said, if it was solid before compression, uh, that's when we have problems. Yeah, alcohol. Alcohol is nothing more than either methanol or ethanol. Uh, you know, which is 100%. Usually ethanol is what they tend to run in alcohol racks and alcohol funny cars. Alright guys, keep those questions coming. I, uh, I really enjoy that. Uh, you know, don't be bashful. Keep those questions coming in. There's more questions I have coming in, the longer I'll stay on. Alright, I see I have 15, 16 people on. Nine thumbs up. Please keep hitting that thumbs up, folks. I appreciate that. Yeah. Alcohol and nitro does burn cooler than gasoline. Yes, it does. And, uh, of course, a cool engine is a happy engine. All right. Guys, uh, you know, I really appreciate you being on here today. I hope you will continue to watch my channel. I'm going to give everybody the opportunity who has a channel of their own to plug it. Uh, even if you don't have a channel in your, your own and you uh, would like to plug somebody else's channel that you watch, please feel free to go ahead and do that. All right. Yeah, let's see. Martin, any experience with hydrogen injection to improve mileage? Uh, you know, I've... <laughs> it's funny you ask that, Martin. I was involved for a short period of time with a fellow that was working on hydrogen injection systems for diesels. And, uh... You know, he had tested them out and was in the process of testing them. I haven't heard much more about it. Uh, I don't know where it went, whether the, uh, you know, oil companies shut them down or, or what. But, uh, you know, they don't like anything that is going to improve fuel mileage on anything. Uh, you know, we had, you know, I remember water injection back in the mid-70s, you know, for gasoline and diesel engines. I'm no chemist, but it makes sense to me since hydrogen, you know, is a fuel, uh, it would improve, you know, fuel mileage and improve performance. Uh, same thing with water injection. Again, I'm no chemist, I don't admit to be, but again, it makes sense. Since water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen atoms, uh, you know, hydrogen being a fuel and oxygen being an oxidizer, I would think if there is some type of chemical breakdown in that process, that again, uh, by extracting hydrogen and oxygen from water, uh, and burning it in a combustion chamber would improve both fuel mileage and performance. Hope that helped answer that question. 
Alrighty. Brett Stevens asks, do you think mechanics are compensated fairly after buying thousands and thousands of dollars in tools and the knowledge that they have to have when they have to do... Jeez, uh, I'm trying to read that next one and I'm sorry I can't. Oh, when they have to earn it. Quite frankly, uh, I don't think that the shops are compensating mechanics as well as they should. Uh, if you own your own shop, then you're compensating yourself, hopefully. But, uh, you know, you can't overprice yourself either in this day's competitive market. Uh, as far as the thousands and thousands of dollars of tools goes, yes. The ongoing joke that my wife and I have always had between us is that our vacation home is sitting out in the toolboxes in my garage. All right, it is very expensive, especially good tools. And as a professional mechanic, you do need good tools. All right. Uh, I feel that the shops could do better, especially the dealerships, as far as compensating and providing better benefits packages for their technicians. Uh, by the way, we tend to like to be referred to as technicians this day. Uh, instead of mechanics, a technician uh, tends to infer that you have the education that goes along with it. So uh, I appreciate being called a technician. Joe Peak, what about airbags on a pickup? Will it increase gross vehicle weight rating or just help with leveling? It'll do a few things for you, Joe. Uh, we were talking about earlier, uh, talking about that a little earlier on a 2500 with a 6 to 8 inch lift that had uh, airbag suspension on it. Airbags will make the vehicle ride better. All right, the uh, earlier listener said his 2500 rides like a Cadillac. It will improve the amount of gross vehicle weight that you can tow. Uh, and it also helps with leveling, so it does all three. Hope that answered that question for you, Joe. Billy Boy says, I ran my 572 locked out at 40 degrees with a 13.701 running avgas. Yeah. All right, Billy, sounds like uh, you're really into this, uh, probably more into the racing end than I am. Uh, okay, I assume when you talk about your 572 locked out at 40 degrees that you're talking about the uh, inclination you were climbing and that is awesome if you can be able to climb a 40 degree uh, hill with that that's uh, that's absolutely awesome buddy Billy boy aluminum heads yeah aluminum heads smoking says Doug maybe when Carl brings the dinghy you can do a video on outboard tune-up uh, yeah, we could try to do something like that. Uh, actually, I'm going to be doing some tuning on, uh, on my lawnmower. Uh, my wife actually took it into our local shop, charged me $160, and uh, was supposed to overhaul the carburetor on it, and uh, I don't think he did, to be honest with you. Uh, it still has trouble starting. I still have the same problems with it that I had before I bought it in. Took it back to him, and he says he won't do anything for me, so that's the end of him. I'm not using him anymore. Uh, looks like I'm going to have to go in there and do that myself. Oh, Billy Bush says that was his boat. Okay, sorry, Bill. Sorry, you know, uh, I tend to be more automotive-related than marine-related here, and that's just my thinking, so uh, excuse me. All right, my bad. All right, guys, let's see how are we doing here. All right, guys, like I says, uh, if nobody is going to, uh, you know, to have any more questions for me, I'm going to think about wrapping this up. Uh, I do want to just give you a couple of tips. Uh, these are a couple of hacks that I learned along the way from some uh, old timers. Uh, you know, people tend to ask me, Doug, uh, you know, is there stuff that I can use that's not uh, an automotive product to uh, clean the fog and the yellowing from my headlight lenses? Well, there were a couple of things that I've used in the past that uh, tend to work. Uh, one is Deep Woods Off. Spray it on an old sock and take that sock, wipe the lens in a circular motion, and you'll find that it will restore the yellowing and clear up the clarity of the lens. Another way of doing it is to take toothpaste, apply it in a circular motion again to the lens, let it dry, and then buff it off with a clean, dry rag you'll find that those two hacks will definitely help you see better at night and uh, will definitely clean up your headlights. Okay, are you trying to say timing? 
Billy Boy, is that timing that you're trying to say? 30 degrees or 40 degrees advanced timing? Yeah, I guess that's what you're trying to say. Okay, it's 572 locked out at 40 degrees with 13.7 to 1 running half gas. Okay, yeah, I, I assume that's what you're trying to say. Yeah, the timing. That's what I thought you were talking about. We're not going to talk about cancer here. This is an automotive show. All right, we talk about anything automotive related. So uh, if, unless you have an automotive request in Big Jam, uh, I'm not even going to go there. Okay, please keep your questions to something automotive related. Billy Boy, yes, I'm sorry, Billy, you know, I'm a little slow on the uptake, like I said, uh, you know, uh, not that all that marine-oriented, but I, I finally picked up on what you were trying to tell me, and uh, that's awesome, that is absolutely awesome, all right, all right, any more questions, let's get them coming in, nope, all right, folks, if there's no more, yes, Billy Boy, Steve Ford, uh, Steve says, thanks for the stream, Doug. Look forward to the next one. Cheers. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. Billy Boy, thank you. Yeah, it's a lot of advance. It sure is, John. But, uh, you know, when you're running a high-compression motor like that, 13.7 uh, to 1 on Avgas, you can advance the ignition that much and still keep them running. Uh, I imagine it was probably a hell of a lope in that engine at idle if it ran at idle with that type of advance. But, uh... You know, there you go. I mean, that's the way to the way to do it. Big Jim, do you have the new Nightblood Sukon calibers? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm sorry for that, Big Jim. Maybe you can elaborate. I don't know what you mean by Sukon calibers. Nightblood Sukon calibers. I have no clue. Great channel, Doug. You will do great. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. Yeah, it keeps the detonation down. It sure does, Billy. It sure does. Yeah, when you're running ab gas, you want to do that because you will blow holes right through the pistons. Yeah, John. Yeah, I, I understand, John, I that you do believe him, but that is a lot. Uh, actually, John, as you increase the RPMs, you need to advance the timing more and more. Uh, so that's not uh, all that crazy an amount of advance. You know, Big Jam, you're gone. You're gone, Big Jam. You know, I, I, I don't need this aggravation. If you're one of John's trolls, then uh, goodbye to you. All right, folks, at this point in time, I'm going to sign off. Uh... Please keep in mind, you know, that I'm on every Saturday, and uh, 